Session 7 of Ecology as Theology, Inspiring Science for Challenging Times, The Prodigal Species Comes Home. So the first six sessions is what we covered here. And this, session number seven, is on staying sane, sober, and inspired in chaotic and contracting times. Last summer, a dear friend and colleague, Daniel Dancer, turned me on to this quote from Gary Snyder in his book, Practice of the Wild. Our immediate business and our quarrel is with ourselves. It would be presumptuous to think that Gaia much needs our prayers or healing vibes. Human beings themselves are at risk, not just on some survival of civilization level, but more basically on the level of heart and soul. We are in danger of losing our souls. We are ignorant about our own nature and confused about what it means to be a human being. So staying sane, sober, and inspired in chaotic and contracting times. The first thing is to remember who we are, remember the big picture, to interpret life mythically, and to practice what I call the five L's of pro-future living. The big picture, of course, I'm meaning the great story, the epic of evolution, big green history. It's, it's the, the history of everyone and everything as our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story. And my most significant female mentor is Joanna Macy, and this quote just nails it. There is science now to construct the story of the journey that we've made on this earth, the story that connects us with all beings. Right now, we need to remember that story, to harvest it and to taste it, for we are in a hard time, and it is the knowledge of the bigger story that's going to carry us through. So here are some things that Connie and I find deeply inspiring about the epic of evolution, great story, the big picture. The first is the sense of identity or self. There's an expansion, the greening of the self, the, the enlargening of the self, that our self does not stop with our skin, or as Alan Watts used to say, the skin encapsulated ego, that our self includes the larger body of life of, upon which we are part and ultimately the universe, that the universe began 14 billion years ago and has been expanding and unfolding and complexifying. And in us, the universe has begun to contemplate its own nature, that we are literally nature uncovering its own nature. We are the universe becoming aware of itself. We are not separate from the universe. In fact, Brian Swim says, four, four billion years ago, the earth was molten rock, and now it sings opera. Another quote, he says, the entire history of the universe can be summed up in two sentences. You take a great cloud of hydrogen gas and you just leave it alone and it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. So Thomas Berry regularly reminded audiences that you, you cannot be alienated. You can feel alienated if you have a worldview that's out, out of touch with reality, but you can't be alienated. The big picture, the great story, reveals the way. It reveals the way to live in right relationship to reality, the way to live back with God in the garden, to use mythic language, the way to live in a mutually enhancing relationship with primary reality. Again, that's what session two was about. The recognition that primary reality is primary and must be treated as such. Every sustainable culture knew that. Every unsustainable culture forgets it. It's not religion or science. It's religion and science. Again, the two need each other like, like a spiral, like DNA. Science needs religion. Religion needs science. We, that's why I mentioned earlier that this, again, the second session is on the, the evolutionary significance of religion, the religious necessity of science. It realizes God and mythic language, that our mythic understandings, all mythic language can be interpreted in an unnatural way or an undeniable way. In fact, the last session will be on that almost entirely. So it realizes mythic insights. We don't have to interpret this stuff in an otherworldly way, in an unnatural way. It can be interpreted as saying something poetic, something mythic about this one reality in which we live and move and have our being. Death as holy and vital, as sacred, as necessary. That's what the previous program was about. The spiral shape of history. History is not just circular. History is not just linear. There's a spiral shape. It's been said somewhat humorously that, that uh, history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. 
That is, we see these patterns, again, as the rise and fall of civilizations. The only time there hasn't been a sense of history has been when we've been living totally sustainable and each culture is passing on the wisdom of how to do that. Those have been ahistorical times for most of human history, but at least the last seven to 10,000 years, we've had a sense of history. And now we understand the spiral nature to history that we get through the great story, the epic of evolution. It sacralizes evolution and ecology. One of my prime reasons for being, you could say my mission in life, is to, to do what I can to help ensure that evolution and ecology are treated as sacred and thus pass through the coming bottleneck. The, it reveals the twin anti-future follies of perpetual progress or imminent apocalypse. Turns out those are the least likely things that we find in contracting societies. Yet it turns out that most people believe in one of those two delusions. The difference between problems and predicaments. That problems can be potentially solved. Predicaments have to be lived with, adapted to. The Epic of Evolution offers realistically inspiring visions, not pie in the sky and the by and by, but realistically inspiring visions of the future, long term. And finally, it sacralizes soil, forests, and water. Now, these are, this is just a short list, but these are the things that I find particularly inspiring about this epic of evolution. It sacralizes, makes sacred soil, forests, water. Building topsoil and planting trees while nurturing community is perhaps the most holy work that we can be engaged in. I mentioned earlier in the last program that Connie is one of the leading voices in the field of assisted migration, assisting trees in migrating north. We can all do this. And I love this quote from Paul Hawken. He says, there's a rabbinical teaching that says that if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. So when I speak about the five L's of being faithful to the future, love something, learn something, let go of something laugh at something, and pass something forward, legacy. To love something green, love something more than human, learn something, learn something that you can pass on. Let go of something. We can all downshift our expectations. We can downshift our use of energy. We can fly less, drive less, eat lower on the food chain. We can all let go of something. We can turn the thermostat up at certain times of the year and down at other times of the year. Connie and I started doing that three years ago. In the winter, we keep the thermostat um, much cooler, than three degrees cooler than we used to. And in the summer, we try never to use air conditioning or keep it much, much higher than we used to. I laugh at something. It's so important to keep a sense of lightness of being and legacy. Pat, you have gifts and skills that could be passed on to someone. It's important to do that. To regularly commune with your ancestors and your descendants. And yes, of course, I'm speaking imaginatively. It's the only way to do it. By not having a sacred relationship to our ancestors and our descendants, we miss something vital that every sustainable culture knew. That again, your ancestors, for 99% 90, of your ancestry, they had it a lot harder than you have. And when you, realize, when you commune, that is when you simply have an imaginary conversation in your own heart, your own meditation, they can give you guidance. Again, there's nothing woo-woo about this. It's simply imaginably communing with your ancestors and communing with those ahead of you, those, those who will come after. To trust reality, celebrate impermanence. Remember last program on the necessity of mortality and death in a nested and evolving that is a divinely creative cosmos. And that's not just personally. It's, again, accepting and celebrating the fact that our species will not last forever. And that's part of God's plan, to use religious mythic language. That's part of the way things really are and always have been. And to engage in the great work, the great work of helping to ensure or doing what we can to ensure a just, healthy, and sustainably life-giving future. And to honor your sadness and grief. It's so important to honor the fact that the, uh, Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and finally leading to finding the gift and being involved locally, pro-future local action. And we, most of us spiral back and forth and some of our, most of our friends and family are in some of these places. We can have compassion for each other. It's so important to honor your sadness and grief. 
honor the fact that you had expectations living the most difficult time it turns out to be alive is in the turning point where we grew up in ages of expansion and expanding possibilities and expectations and we are now living in a time of contraction it turns out throughout human history those have been the most important psychologically difficult times to be alive and that's what we're alive in now and many of us are even questioning what we did in our lives it's important to have compassion for ourselves and each other Engaging in the great work to learn and feel together, learn about deep sustainability together and feel the stages of grief with each other, finding strength and support in community. And as I mentioned earlier on this page here, deep sustainability, I have over a thousand hours of free audios. Uh, you consider I can consider it. I do consider it deep sustainability scripture, the most important and inspiring books and essays related to right relationship to primary reality and to the future, and they're all available for free. Or you can just Google sustainability audios or grace limits audios. Bill Nye's Global Meltdown. We watched this a few years ago. This is free. It's up on YouTube. It was done by uh, National Geographic, and um, uh, it, it's fabulous. It, Bill Nye, the science guy, is the client, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is the therapist, and he's helping Bill Nye through the stages of grief. And it's absolutely hysterical. These guys had way too much fun making this. It's only 40 minutes long up on YouTube, but I highly recommend it. Bill Nye's Global Meltdown. Stand and work together in a planetary emergency. Collective action matters most. It's through social movements and local citizen involvement that real pro-future change can happen. We can all use less, less energy, less stuff, less stimulation. I got this from John Michael Greer. One of his books is Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush. And get active. Find where your passion and the future's needs intersect. There's an exercise I, I've done for years with audiences where I have people take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, and then basically write on the left-hand side all the things that light you up, give you joy, give you energy, a sense of fulfillment and happiness, things that you're good at, things other people tell you that you're good at, etc. And you list all that. And at the top of the list, you put my great joy. And then on the right-hand side, list all the places, all the things where you feel the world's needs, not just where you intellectually know about what's needed, but where do you feel it? Where do you get angry? Where do you get depressed? And especially, where do you feel compassion? And list all that stuff. And then just pay attention to your heart. You don't have to call it prayer or meditation if you don't want to. Just pay attention to your heart. There's wisdom when we pay attention to the center of our chest and ask guidance from there. What you're trying to do basically is play mix and match. Where are the intersections between what lights you up, what gives you joy, what gives you energy, and what the world's needs are or your community's needs as you feel them? And those places where your joy and the world's needs intersect, that's your calling. That's your mission. That's your vocation. And I encourage people to do that every five years or so. Pro-future prophetic activism. When I speak in Christian contexts, I call it Christian. Pro-future and Christian, I use those terms interchangeably. It's not just immoral, it is evil to irreparably harm the future for short-term personal or institutional gain. Yet we have a global economic system supported by governments on every continent and accepted by adherents of every faith, ensuring that it's not only legal to betray posterity, it's profitable, highly profitable. So how do we live? What do we do? And how do we confront what is anti-future and thus evil? In other words, how do we protest and non-violently resist modern-day structural, organizational, and institutional, that is, legal evil? This is a prophetic quote from Teddy Goldsmith. It's an astonishing thought that we can completely destroy this planet, make it uninhabitable, and assure the extinction of our species and countless others without violating a single law. That's what Gandhi was about. That was, that's what Martin Luther King Jr. was about. They were about confronting nonviolently social injustice, institutional injustice, structural injustice, legal evil. And this is the cover of Martin Luther King Jr.'s autobiography. Uh, it's, it has a picture of uh, Gandhi in the background. And this poster I found at a church down in Atlanta and had my picture taken. It says, Integrity. When your character is built on a spiritual and moral foundation, your contagious way of life will influence millions. I can only hope. So consequently, we're seeing the return of prophets. Not prophets channeling an otherworldly entity and not prophets predicting the future, but prophets who see what's real, who speak a word of warning to the people that's basically, folks, we need to get in right relationship to reality or else we're going to suffer. 
We're going to perish. And I consider James Hansen a modern-day prophet. Here, one of the most respected scientists for decades on the issue of climate is now regularly and repeatedly getting arrested. And when I say regularly and repeatedly, I mean it. Now, why this level of activism? Well, he himself says why. It's because of his grandchildren. And this is one of the best books on climate change, Storms of My Grandchildren, The Truth About the Coming Climate Catastrophe and Our Last Chance to Save Humanity. Here he is with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now!, a little 42nd segment. These, these protests are what do we call civil resistance uh, in the same way that Gandhi did. We're trying to draw attention to the injustice because this, this is really analogous. This, this is a moral issue analogous to that faced by Lincoln with slavery or by Churchill with uh, Nazism. Because what we have here is a tremendous case of intergenerational injustice because we are causing the problem but our children and grandchildren are going to suffer the consequences and our parents didn't know that they were causing a problem for future generations but we do the science has become very clear and we're going to have to move to a clean energy future and we could do that and there would be many other advantages of doing it why don't we do it because of the special interests and because of the role of money in washington this is one of the reasons why campaign finance reform in the United States is so vital, so necessary. I love this quote from Jonas Salt. This is a 2,000-year-old alligator juniper tree that the 19 firefighters that were killed in the Yarnell Fire, the Granite Mountain Hotshots, saved this tree 10 days before they died in that blast. In that fire and there's a movie called only the brave it's one of connie's and my favorite movies i highly recommend it where they save this 2000 year old tree just before they died i love this quote from jonas salk our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors many times poets are our most profound prophets here's a modern day poet drew dillinger this poem is called hieroglyphic stairway it's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started failing, as the mammals Reptiles, birds were all dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? I'm riding home on the coma train. I've got the voice of the Milky Way in my dreams. I have teams of scientists feeding me data daily and pleading I immediately turn it into poetry. I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. I am the desirous earth, equidistant to the underworld and the flesh of the stars. I am everything already lost. The moment the universe turns transparent and all the light shoots through the cosmos, I use words to instigate silence. I'm a hieroglyphic stairway in a buried Mayan city, suddenly exposed by a hurricane. A satellite circling Earth, finding dinosaur bones in the Gobi Desert. I am telescopes that see back in time. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I can't sleep. Because my great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the Earth was unraveling? I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. I keep a picture of my granddaughter by my computer. She's the future, calling me to do what I can do. What's a God's eye view of the world? So often we think of it as the view from above and outside at all, but I suggest to you know that's a trivial understanding. That's a human-centered understanding. 
This is a God's eye view of the world, the subjective experience from within every creature, from within every consciousness must be included. This is reality, how reality sees. The eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. I suggest to you that this mythic frame is one of the most empowering ways to think religiously, mythically, that the past is rooting for us. Because whatever, whatever has given your life meaning over the course of your life, the thousands of things that have given your life meaning, the final meaning of your life is your legacy. So this idea of the past is rooting for us and the future is calling us to greatness. Staying sane, sober, and inspired in chaotic and contracting times is to live as if the past is rooting for us and the future calling us to greatness. Again, this is a beta version. I recommend or I request uh, any and all suggestions for improvement 